Coming to you from the Laser Light Recording Studios in Waterville, Ohio, it's the Midnight Blue and Gold Launchpad Podcast. I'm Rocket Ryan Brandt. And I am Pat Jillick, a.k.a. PJ Spiller. Joining us tonight is our producer and engineer extraordinaire, Kyle W. Smith. And we also welcome a new addition to the podcast this evening. It is Ben Sullivan. Ben is a graduate of Central Catholic High School right here in Toledo, born and raised, a graduate of the University of Toledo, and he's been so kind to offer us his services to uh, be able to enhance our podcast a little bit and make us be able to be more in-depth about the Rockets. And and before he gets to talking, I also like the fact he brings the average age down, kind of like what Zach Powheida did. Right, right. <laughs> so he brings he brings the average age down. He brings the knowledge level way up, which is nice. He's had a little experience in scouting some of the players. And uh, Ben, you know, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what brought yourself to the uh, program. Well, gentlemen, I first want to say thanks for having me. I'm excited to be a part of the program. Um, and Ryan, super excited I could help out in that average age department and try and lower <laughs> us down a little bit. Um, but yeah, as, as you said, Pat, I'm a graduate of Central Catholic here in Toledo. I grew up five minutes up the road from the Glass Bowl, so spent a lot of my childhood at UT watching the Rockets play. Um, I was chatting with Kyle a little bit before we went live with um, just the different eras of Rocket football that I've seen. We had the Bruce Gradkowski era. We had the Logan Woodside era. Um, so a lot of great rocket football that I've seen and just excited to sit over here and chat with you guys about it. Um, and as you mentioned, I've scouted a little bit of the UT games. I'm a huge football fan in general. Um, would love to eventually get a job working in football in some capacity, whether it's scouting, whether it's doing this, talking about it, which would be a dream. Um, so really in any capacity I can help out and we could chat rocket football. I'm, I'm excited to do it. So ha- happy to be here, gentlemen. And we are so happy to have you here as well. And I think you're going to be a welcome addition to the program. Uh, anything that you can bring, your insight, uh, your different points of view are going to be surely welcome. No, I heard you say, gentlemen, you were talking to Kyle and Pat there. What, are, you know, what about me? Oh, I'm, I'm, there's no way I'm a gentleman. I got to include <laughs> you in that. This is a new wave of the Midnight Blue and Gold launch pad, right? But anyway, you're included. Our, pl- our plans it. are to have Ben uh, bring a little segment in the first few episodes of players to look out for and... He's going to be helping in many different ways. So from there, we will uh, move on to our first topic, which will be a review of the San Jose State game. Ryan. Actually, no, it's a fan question of the week. you got to follow the script here, Pat. Come on. <laughs> well, it's, it's a rough outline. So, <laughs> Oh, I didn't know it. It was living, living and breathing, kind of like our Constitution, you know. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so anyway, let, let's, let's go ahead and talk about the uh, – uh, how did this topic get started? We, 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 this first week we've done this, we put it out on Twitter and or X, whatever it's called now. And, and, we, and then we ended up reposting it on several uh, social media platforms. So, yeah. So what, so go ahead and tell me how this all got started, you guys. I, I just woke up one day and I saw it on there. I'm thinking, this is kind of a cool idea. Yeah. Um, I believe I spotted it first on our uh, podcast page on Apple Music. And someone had a suggestion and said, man, it would be great if uh, – we could submit some questions as fans of the show and uh, maybe use them as discussion points or just answer the question straight up. So I like that idea and kind of tested it here. Yeah, very cool. You put it out and we kind of we put it out on, like I said, several different platforms and got a pretty good response. And of course, the first question comes from Dan Savage, a big Rockets fan. He was on the staff for a while, I think as a student, might have been a videographer, you know, helping out in that capacity. So the guy, he loves the Rockets as much as we do. And his question is, if Toledo was in the American Conference, that's the American Athletic Conference, and rid of the midweek maction, but instead played a Thursday and Friday night game in October, like those schools, would Toledo draw better? I, I think they would, just from the standpoint, the weather's better, it's a Thursday or Friday, people don't, you know... If you stay up late on a Thursday, you just have to power through Friday, and right. you're fine. Those Tuesdays and Wednesdays are for the birds. I, I I tend to agree with you. I think the only the only you know downfall of that is on Friday nights if you have families that are in you know have have kids in in high school football. Mm-hmm. There's a distraction from that, and and then you get into the playoffs in high school football, and they run. You know, anywhere from Thursday to Sunday, you know, when you get down to the the uh, playoffs, 
for right. the high schools. But other than that, I think it's a good idea. I, I, I think it would do nothing but enhance. The Tuesday-Wednesday games, I mean, honestly, unless you're betting games or you're a fan of one of the programs playing, how many people are they really drawing unless right. it's a big rivalry? Right. I mean, basically, you know, those action games are to help ESPN fill programming. Exactly. Um, here's, here's part two of that question. Uh, the home schedule, hypothetically, would be Navy, East Carolina, South Florida, and Charlotte. And you pick which two are weekdays. So, you know, I think almost you got to have Navy and USF on the weekends just because exactly. you're going to get a pretty good contingent of people coming. East Carolina is a, is a program I just can't imagine how they can draw 40,000 people each and every game. I mean, they're out in the middle of nowhere. But they still do. In the TV market of Greenville, North Carolina, not South Carolina, North Carolina, Greenville, New Bern. Right, yeah. Where the hell's that? Exactly. You know, what does it cost you, 40 40 cents for a 30-second spot in that TV market? Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) But, uh, no, seriously, I I think, obviously, the USF and Navy games are the games you put on a weekend because, of course, any any veteran of any branch of the service is going to be watching, you know, a, a game with, involving a service academy, and and USF is the largest, one of the largest universities in the country. Yeah, them along with UCF. I mean, they're they're rivals. You know, the war on I four, which is a great name for a rivalry. Right. But yeah. So anyway, hey, we appreciate the the topic, Dan. Uh, congratulations for being the first one. I I don't know what did he win anything for that. Maybe we'll give him a koozie. Yeah, you can stop by the bus, pick up your free koozie. And their supplies are limited, so. Exactly, and maybe we'll throw a beverage in your koozie for you. Yeah, we don't want to be empty-handed. Exactly. So next, we move on to the recap of last week's game. We were all there. Well, at least Ryan and I were there. Kyle had uh, previous engagements with his band, and I heard it was a great turnout anyway for that. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, They're German American Fest, Oktoberfest, down in um, down in down the, in BG, a, in the a, hated land of Bowling Green. Yeah, but. It, it was a good crowd though, and uh, down at Brewing Green, they have some phenomenal craft beers. You should definitely go check that out. Absolutely, and uh, so yeah, we were there. It it was a a back and forth game. You know, first half was not pretty for the Rockets. Uh, we knew coming in that San Jose State was going to have a nice running game. Their quarterback had a hell of a game the week before. He threw for 520-some yards or something like that, but it was against uh, vastly— Cal Poly. Uh, yeah, Cal, Cal Poly. Poly, a vastly inferior team. Uh, so I, I kind of liken them. I think we all kind of liken them to Toledo coming into this game, but it was nice that our defense showed up, and then in the second half, our, our offense you know, came to life. Uh, Penny Boone ended up with getting the uh, MAC Offensive Player of the Week, getting 123, I think, yards. Uh, and most of those were in the second half. He had 90, 96 yards in the second half. So nice to see the team be resilient, uh, you know, up against the ropes and come back. And and it was nicely finished off by Chris McDonald with that pick six. And that en- ended up being the uh, winning score. Uh, so I think that was that was maybe a little bit of a wake-up call after the – you know, the big victory the week before to that, hey, you guys, you know, you need to come down to earth. We're we're getting ready to start the max season with Western Michigan this week. But your thoughts on the on the uh, San Jose State game, Ryan? Well, I mean, you know, no score after one. I mean, you know, we expect a little more scoring than this. Right. For sure. But I you, took the over, you know, me. and we talked to I talked to Alex from the the CSC podcast. And I asked him as the game started, what was your thinking in picking San Jose State as a winner, which he did last week? And he said, well, Toledo gets off to a slow start traditionally, and San Jose State tends to jump on on that. And it's exactly what happened. You know, San Jose State got off to a nice start. We started off slowly, but we didn't cave. And so thankfully, his prediction didn't come true. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to come back down 10 nothing to go on that 18 play 98 yard scoring drive that took 6:30 off the clock with 11 seconds to go before going to the locker room to cut it to 10-7 that there was a momentum changer despite the fact San Jose State came right back out and scored on their first possession 
to make it 17-7. But, you know, there's never, I never really worried too much about this because. I know. I, 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 I'm like, okay, we're down 17-7. Still a lot of ball game left to be played. For sure. And then we came back and, and you know scored a couple touchdowns to end the third, and there's no more scoring. So the defense really buckled up in the uh, fourth quarter and came away with the victory. What are your thoughts there, Ben? Yeah, I think you guys hit the nail on the head. I mean, that big play or that big drive before half, to me, was crucial. Um, getting down 98-yard 98, 98 drive, as you mentioned, 18 plays, I believe it was. Um, really, to me, that changed the entire course of the game. I thought the sideline looked a little flat leading up to that possession, and I really think Finn kind of got some confidence going. And we even mentioned, I believe you guys mentioned last week, that the first couple weeks he hasn't really got into his group. He didn't look very comfortable the first half against Illinois. Obviously, against Texas Southern, we were doing everything we wanted to do in all facets of the game, running, passing, whatever we wanted we could do. Um, so I think that drive kind of got him going, and it really got the offensive line, got the running backs going a little bit. Penny Boone looked good all day for the most part, but I think it just jazzed up the whole team. So it was it was good to see a resilient rocket victory. It took some courage. Well, I do know that uh, Downtown Coaches Association this week, Coach Candle was very happy with Penny Boone, the fact that he's now in shape. He's now a fit back. Down to 242, quote, right. unquote. Right. He was he was pretty beefy last year. Looked like Jerome Bettis a little yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. Now he's more of a, uh, a power back, you know, and, and, you know, and it showed off, you know, 13 carries, 123 yards. He didn't score any touchdowns, but you know what? He had three the game before, so. That's right. He well, made up for it. Ben, talking a little bit about uh, what you mentioned with Finn, he he got his feet under him. He he got a little bit more, more confidence. Uh, he's leading the Mac in passing yards, or I'm sorry, he's third in the Mac in passing yards, 186 yards a game. He's second in passing efficiency uh, at 147.16 uh, rating, and he is third in total offense with 234 yards. I saw a little bit of stuff on social media this week that hey. Why hasn't Daquan Finn been replaced? Why didn't we go out and get a better quarterback this year? You know what? When you've got a quarterback that's doing that kind of thing for your team, it's it, it's a no-brainer. And obviously, you know, these people haven't watched the Rockets and what he's capable of doing in the past three years, let alone this year. And there's more than stats. You, you have to watch him play. Oh, exactly. The guy was a game changer last year. Exactly. And and also in that game, th- it was great to see the defense, you know, buckle up. They bowed up in the second half. Quinion Mitchell, he had four passes broken up in that game. Uh, most of them in the in the second half. He's one he's one shy of his career high. Uh, he has thirty four on his career, and he moves a mark uh, just ahead of Mark Heron from uh, who was a great defensive back from ninety three to ninety six, who had thirty two. Uh, he's third on the all time list, and he was second in the nation in t- with twenty breakups last year. And this year, he's on pace to have twenty four pass breakups this season. As I said at the Downtown Coaches Association, Quinion Mitchell has more breakups than Liz Taylor. And, and, and if you looked at the audience and you saw all the people that are a lot older than me, they just thought that was hilarious. Oh, they loved it. But, <laughs> but, but, in, but in this room, they have no idea what you're yeah. talking about. Ryan knows his crowd. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Play to your strengths. That's right. If I have any, I'll find You know, I, I broke down the game film even though I couldn't be at the game. Uh, one player that just kept catching my eye, and his stat line isn't going to show it, but Nate Bauer. Yeah. That dude knows where dude. to be, and he hits that line of scrimmage like a linebacker, which he used to play. Right. But he has the makings of a good NFL nickel back. I, He just knows where to be on that line of scrimmage, and he's a great run stuffer. Yeah, he's got those intangibles. You know, the, 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 he's, got that, he's got that mind for being on the field, and where to be in there at the right moment yeah i don't know if you guys noticed either but texas southern and uh san jose both started the game with a deep pass right what's Um, what's the thought there we have a great defensive backfield even with max and hook i don't know if they're trying to catch somebody sleeping or what the deal is but uh both games both teams started their first play well as as uh cory parker said in the past his guys are going to be the best guys on the field if he can make it happen. And we have complete confidence in his coaching ability. And it's been obvious, you know, you're going to open up a game with a long pass like that. You know what? You're just flirting with disaster. Okay, Ryan, ready for the ZZ top? No, that's Molly reference. Hatchet. Or Molly Hatchet, <laughs> my bad. Bum, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll uh, maybe we'll get Kyle's band to play that. And I'll, uh, 
I'll just throw that part in. Flirting with disaster. There you go. But anyway, um, you know, like we mentioned before, uh, Daquan Finn only 92 yards passing. Jawan Newton catching four of those balls for 31 yards and a touchdown. And, uh, you know, he didn't really need to pass. I mean, the Rockets won. Yeah, I mean, he had 62 yards rushing, and then Penny Boone had his... 123. Yeah, 123. So there's really not a not a lot of need for him to throw it all over the field. It's kind of a weird stat line, though, if you kind of break it down based on the score. Um, Toledo was behind, and it still seemed like, based on the stats, they were trying to control the clock. Mm-hmm. Right, because I think there was a... Uh, uh, not a significant difference in time of possession, but I, I agree with you, Kyle. They they were trying to c- control the clock for sure. On the defensive side of the ball, I like Dan Bolden, the fact that he's finally got to play three games this year. I mean, that, that, that's incredible. That, that kind of alluding to a, an article from the Toledo Blade written by Kyle Rowland and uh, the fact that, you know, he's he's doing well. I mean, here, here's the amazing thing, too. He's 6'1", 250, playing middle linebacker in the, in the MAC. That's a wrecking machine right there. So, um, yeah, he had six tackles, two were solo. Dallas Gant had eight, and leading the way was Zach Ford in the backfield with nine total. Zach Ford is a guy who they're just the, – the whole administration at UT just loves a guy. I mean, he's, he's a student first. He has his degree. He's working on his master's. And, in fact, he may already have his master's. I think he's working on his second master's. That's how smart this you're, kid is. You're starting to see that more often with the COVID year. Yeah, take advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah, get all your – all that nonsense out of the way. You know, and I, I think you mentioned it last week, Kyle, that Dallas Gann has been kind of quietly piling up stats. That he's nobody, close to nobody 30 noticed. tackles, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he had nine this last game, four solo. Or I'm, I'm sorry, he had eight this last game, two solo. And he's just kind of quietly always there. You know, he, he's cleaning it up. And, and then, you know, that kind of leads me into Western Michigan. I'm not going to jump ahead, but their leading tackler is a defensive back who's a stud, but, I mean, if you're getting that deep into the backfield, there's there's something wrong with your front. It kind of reminds you of the Barry Church years here at Toledo. Right. Because uh, Toledo was terrible when Church oh, yeah. was here. I feel oh, bad that oh, they, they wasted his talents. That was when we had the, uh, you know, the spread defense. Yes. Yeah. The aptly named spread defense coined by one Ron Musselman, Ron Musselman, former scribe, retired scribe from the Blade and the yeah. Post-Gazette. Yeah, I mean, the defensive linemen and linebackers are just kind of spread all over the field and leave <laughs> giant gaps. So I love that. That's a great, that's a great line. Yeah. So, um, you know, Chris but, McDonald, what, what's up with that guy? Uh, I mean, all he, he does is do pick, take pick sixes back to give us the lead. All he does is take pick sixes. I mean, league. he did it yeah. against Notre Dame. He did it, you know, at San Jose State. Yep. And it was really impressive. Like I said, again, the defense defense stepped up. They held uh, San Jose State to 43 yards in the in the fourth quarter. Uh, and then, you know, we had the pick six to seal the game. They couldn't really do anything. They had 40 yards rushing, one touchdown in the second half. So, I mean, obviously... I've always said that for about the past five, four or five years that we are a second half team. Candle and his staff does a great job adjusting at halftime. Usually, no matter what the situation, we come out strong the second half. So uh, leading into that, um, I think we take a look at Western Michigan this season or this, this coming week. Uh, Western Michigan, traditionally a ball, you know, a ball running team. They they don't throw a lot. They've got a new head coach. Mainly the the rest of the staff is intact, so there's not a lot of transition there. But they have a new head coach, and they also have the leading rusher in the uh, MAC coming into this game. He didn't do a lot against uh, in their last game, uh, but he I think he ended up with 32 yards rushing. But he's averaging 109 110 yards a game. So I think that's that's going to present a little bit of a problem for the Rockets. But then again, coming into the game, San Jose State was a prim- primarily rushing team, and we took care of them. So hopefully, good things will happen. Yes, and, and you know, Ben, you were um, just a kid. You were well. You would have been probably at UT when when Western went to the Cotton Bowl. It was amazing with, with Corey Davis. Yeah, Corey, yeah, Corey Davis and Jarvion Franklin. I think was a running back. Uh, of course, PJ Fleck. That, yeah, they were in the row the boat era. Yeah, so your uh, your memories of of Western Michigan and and how they've fallen. I mean, the fact that they fired Tim Lester was kind of shocking last year. 
Yeah, it's interesting to see. I mean, Western, as you said, as you mentioned earlier, Pat, they want to run the ball. Ever since the post PJ Fleck era, they've they've tried to commit to that. I mean, I think right now that's that's what they're going to try and do to us next week as well as run the ball. But as you mentioned, Pat, San Jose State had kind of had this similar makeup, although their quarterback did have a big week the week before right. throwing the ball. Right. But I think that I mean, going back to last week, I think that was the most impressive part of that second half effort by UT was they tried to run the ball a little bit to burn some clock and they couldn't get anything going. I mean, I think they ended up with 40 yards rushing accounting for the sack yardage that, you know, I think we had four or five sacks total in that game as well. Um, But if you look at that, they tried to get it going and then we got them in third and longs and then they couldn't, couldn't convert those. I forget what our percentage was in the game, but it was just overall top to bottom. It was a great effort from, from UT and I expect something similar to happen this week and I'm, spoiling a little bit about my breakout players segment in a little bit here <laughs> well, you're fine with that yeah the uh, rockets are going into this game they're favored by 21 and a half and the over under right now is 54 so uh, we'll, we'll get to the predictions part in a moment but talk about head coach lance taylor a little bit 42 year old young fella replacing tim lester who was there lester replaced i'm not mistaken he's the one who replaced pj fleck when fleck went to minnesota yes and so Taylor is a 42-year-old fellow out of, uh, let's see, he, went, he played wide receiver at uh, Alabama under Nick Saban, started as a graduate assistant under Saban. He was an assistant for the Jets, running back coach for Stanford. And of course, that was when Christian McCaffrey was there. Went on to the Panthers as a wide receivers coach, running back coach at Notre Dame. And he was there when they played Toledo, offensive coordinator at Louisville. And then this is his first year, as we mentioned, at uh, Western Michigan with a 1-2 and two record, their lone victory coming 35-17 over my cousin's son's alma mater, the St. Francis Red Flash of Pennsylvania. Yeah, they, they've got they, – they played Syracuse uh, and took a thrashing from them. And, uh, you know, they took on St. Francis and beat them. But I, I – it's nice that their coach has a decent pedigree. Uh, he's been with some nice programs. He's been in the NFL and in college. But I think taking on a, a conference team, you know, a, a mid-American, mid-American conference team, sorry, uh, is, you know, we're, we're, we're not in the, the bottom of the barrel uh, when it comes to FBS teams or pr- conferences. But uh, it is nice to see that he's given this a shot, you know, and, and who knows what it's going to predict, but he's, he's stuck with it. Like I said, they're, they're primarily a rushing team. Their leading rusher is uh, Jalen, uh, Jalen Buckley, Jalen Buckley with 103 yards uh, a, a, a game. And uh, we'll see if, you know, they're able to do anything else against that. Okay, and you mentioned they lost to Syracuse 48-7, lost to Iowa 41-10. So they're um, coming off a, a couple of thrashings there. So, But they did have four or five sacks against Iowa, so their defensive line can get some penetration. Yep, so we're going to have to keep an eye on that, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, we got some predictions to make on this, but we also have a new segment, and that's Ben's Breakout. Is that, is that what we're going to call it? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. Yeah, nice. that does sound. That's about, got a nice about, little ring to it. How about some more alliteration? Big Ben's Breakout. Ooh, Big Ben's even Breakout. Ben, you, you are go. a Pittsburgh guy, huh? That's right. Okay. I always go down there on the side side watch them stores. <laughs> nice Shit. Yins are reference. Y- yins, go ahead there. Yins, go ahead. I like it. I like it. All right, folks. Well, I got two kind of three breakout players for you that we should look up for look out for this coming week. So one offense, kind of two on defense. So our first one... And this isn't an unusual name. Everyone knows Junior, Junior Vandeross. The question is, when are we going to see him have a big game? So two weeks ago against Texas Southern, he had three catches for 26 yards. Nothing really to, you know, snazz at there. But we can, we can expect a little bit more from him, especially with Finn as he continues to get going through the season. And then last week, he had one catch for 13 yards. So the logic here behind this is that Finn, you know, 93 yards, we spoke on it, la- or he had 93 yards last week that we already mentioned. I think this week we're going to see a little bit more of the typical Daquan Finn, and therefore he's going to be looking around. Obviously, we know Adam Beal's out, presumably, this next week. I would imagine I heard, saw something on social media earlier that he was in a walking boot. Maybe that was earlier today. Maybe it was yesterday. So I'm thinking, I mean, Junior's there. He He's looked good. I've been at all the home games thus far this season. He's looked quick. He's looked fast. He's got good hands. So I expect Junior Vandeross to get in the end zone this week. And as far as 
on the defensive side of the ball, we've got Emmanuel McNeil Warren and Braden Alls. So a couple of young DBs. We know Max and Hook, or I should say, I think Max and Hook is potentially going to miss another game. We know those high ankles can kind of linger a little bit. Not sure if we have anything from our source on if uh, Hook's going to be out again. But the logic here is that they're going to uh, Western Michigan's going to get behind in this game. I think they're going to try and run the ball. UT's been very stout against the run, and to keep up with our offense. They're going to need to throw the ball. And I think even, Kyle, going back to your point earlier about the last couple teams have opened up going deep on us in the first play of the game. You know, why do you think that is? And it could be because they're trying to maybe make sure that our young DBs are are not snoozing back there. So I'm actually thinking that our boys are going to potentially pick a pass off this week. It could be either one of these young DBs. Braden Alls is a true freshman. He's only got some limited play time in the last couple games. But Emmanuel McNeil Warren has played extremely well in for Max and Hook. And I think... Based on the the game script that we could see with them getting down early, I think we're in for a big game from these two. That's I like it. Very good breakdown on that. And one thing that uh, we forgot to mention is our Highland Appliance players of the game from last week. Oh, yes. So uh, I think it's pretty obvious on the offensive side of the ball, Penny Boone. Yeah, I'm, I'm down with Penny Boone for sure. 13 carries, 123 yards, averaging 9.5 yards a carry with a long of... 27, and that's off the top of my head because I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> but uh, defensive player of the game, you know, we didn't discuss this, but I'm, I'm going out with the, the honorable yeah, Judge yeah, Culpepper. Honorable Judge. Is that all right with you guys? Yeah, he had he had a couple sacks. He's leading the MAC in sacks, and he's got four sacks on the season, so he's right up at the top of the nation right now. I'd love yeah. to just give some credit to the linebacker core. Like, they were just all over the place. They held it down, so mm-hmm. yeah, it was yeah. just a good defensive effort. Yeah, Gan, I mean, Gan had a heck of a game. When I was there watching, I felt like he was in on every tackle. So yeah, second place, third place, we'll give him a podium finish for this week. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I, I, I Dallas Gan had a great game. Terrence Taylor wasn't as disruptive as the first two games, but he was still in there in the mix the whole time. And Jackson Barrow also had a, n- a nice game filling in. And the special teams player of the week has to be the punter, Emilio Duran. Yes. Five absolutely. punts, 225 yards, average 45, 45 yards of boot. Yeah. We haven't had that in a couple ever, ever since uh, Bailey Flint was and, healthy. Right, and he dropped two, I believe two, if not three, inside the 20. Four. Four inside the 20, yeah, okay. Four out of five, that's that's almost 80%. That's not a bad, no. not, not a bad little ratio. The no. Toledo math. Yeah, that well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, on a Wednesday. <laughs> at the time of this recording. So, yeah. Um, so, congratulations to our Highland Appliance players of the game. So, time to move along to our prediction portion. What do you think? I say so. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Uh, should we uh, give Nate's first since he's not here? Yeah, let's give Nate's a prediction. He is coming to us from the middle of Texas. Longtime fan of Toledo and, and a produ- uh, associate producer on our show. And huge contributor. Just an all-around good guy. And how exactly. many stadiums has he been to again, Kyle? Ooh, he's got to be close to 60, I would say, at this point. Oh, FBS we're, we're, or we're F- FBS, Bolton. right? FBS D1. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Wow. Nice. So, anyway, Nate's prediction, Big Nate. What's Nate's last name again? I always forget. Kresge. That's right. I should know that. Or just... in Central Michigan, we went to the, the camp up there in junior high. They couldn't get his last name, so they called him Croissant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, pretty he, close, right? Well, yeah, little, he, he might have. Yeah. Well, he might have. Oh, he <laughs> might have had a couple croissants in his day. Just yeah. a few. Just a, yeah. Well, what what was that, uh, Kyle? I think you mentioned it on the last episode, or maybe the previous, that when you walked in to see Coach Hallett at, down at Heidelberg, it was like five hundred and fifty pounds walking through the door. My my plane weight was two forty. Nate was three fifteen. <laughs> and that's not bad for high school juniors. Yeah, those are strapping young lads, they like to say. So Nate Kresge, or no, we're going to make his name French, Nate Croissant. <laughs> <laughs> he is saying Toledo 38, Western Michigan 13. I like it. I like and it. That, uh, and again, let's see, that'd be, that would be the un- that would be under, wouldn't it? Yeah, so. Oh, there's what's the over-under on the game? Uh, 54. Okay. So anyway, uh, let's, why don't we just move it on down the line here. Kyle? Yeah. I, I like Nate's Toledo score, 38. Sounds pretty good. Um, maybe 17 for Western. Okay. Get a field goal in there, maybe an early score, late score in garbage time. Yep. Right in the ballpark. And then Ben? 
I've got 31-10, gentlemen. And I will say, Kyle, the garbage time touchdown is the only thing that kind of freaks me out about my prediction. I think we might be up comfortably going into the late fourth quarter and something sloppy might be given up. But I'm pretty confident that the that the Rockets are going to pounce on these boys this weekend. And I looked a little bit into Western Michigan scoring and their opponent scoring and same with Toledo. And the average margin of victory that uh, Western has given up is 24 points so far this season. So I'm going to stick right on that, and I'm going to go Toledo 42, Western Michigan 18. Okay. And now, yeah, I mean, it's funny because I was going to say 31-10, but I don't want to be a cheater. Or yeah, you a, can't copy me. Not on week one. Cabinet. That's just yeah. rude. You're not supposed yeah, you're to be looking guess, at I mean, this. This is your first time. Exactly. Got first time like, he's got the notes and you're just cheating off him. My yeah. God. Yeah. So I'm. I, it's going to be under again. But you know what? Let's go. Actually, no. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to hit the over. 38-17, your final. All right. Yeah, I like right that as well. Yeah. I like that as well. You just copied off of me. Actually, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I misspoke earlier. Western Michigan's average margin of loss was eight or uh, eighteen, and I went twenty-one. So, yeah, or, tw- or twenty-four. So I, I I figured we might get a garbage time touchdown. You know, with with the second team in there. And anyway, it has been great to uh, welcome Ben to our program, and we're lo- we look for great things from him in the future, and hope he will bring us all of his insight and knowledge to help us make this program even better for everyone. I mean, we, we thought we were good before, but with Ben on the scene, how can we not just take it up a notch? Exactly. Take it up to 11, like in... Turn it up to 11. Spinal 11. tap. Yeah, spinal tap. There you go. Thanks. These guys are making me blush. Of course I know that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, spinal tap. All right, on behalf of engineer, producer extraordinaire, that would be the one, the only, Kyle W. Smith. I'm Rocket Ryan Brandt. I am Pat Jillick, a.k.a. PJ Spiller. And I am Ben, clearly need a nickname, Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And also, nice to it. <laughs> joining us on the production board and finally got him on microphone the last couple episodes, the one, the only, Kyle W. Smith. That's right. I mean, we got to, anytime we get the chance to mention him twice, we got to do it because he is. Exactly. He's, he's, he's twice the man I am. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining us, everybody. Go Rockets. T-O-L. E-D-O. E-D-O.